It's good to be back again as we're continuing our study in the book of Acts. <clears throat> and um, this morning we're still continuing to look at the sermon that Stephen preached uh, to those Jews who did not want to hear him and did not want to listen to him and rejected what he was going to say. When you, to give you a perspective, I talked about last time, last week, in regards to worldviews. Uh, the worldview or the belief of the Jews at that time, as the gospel was being proclaimed, the, the worldview of the Jew in regards to the Christian teaching of Christ was that if you were really a true Jew and held to what you believe to be uh, God's will, then you would oppose everything that was taught by Jesus and by anybody associated with him. If someone would rise up and speak in the name of Jesus, uh, you, would, you would automatically be against it, no matter what they say. No matter if you would actually agree with them, it doesn't matter. You oppose everything they say. And, and when you read the book of Acts and you see how the Christians are being treated, it, it will help you to understand why they're being treated in such a negative way from the religious leaders, from those uh, very zealous Jews. The Jews of that time uh, hated anything associated with uh, Jesus Christ. In their, from their perspective, from their understanding, Jesus Christ was not the Messiah. He would never be the Messiah. And he was just a man who died, and he never really rose from the dead, but most likely his disciples came in and stole the body, hid it, so that they could proclaim that Jesus had risen from the dead. From the way they looked at it, they were trying to protect everyone else. They're... they're their ideology was misguided, their thinking was wrong, but they were, they were trying to keep everyone from believing what they thought was a lie. And they really, truly believed that their way of, of, of dealing with the Christians was God's ordained path. They thought they were actually doing God's will. And what you see in this passage is that worldview system, that mindset, that, that way of thinking by these Jews coming in conflict with the truth of Christ. And this, this, this comes in conflict in a major way. And it's these, these Jews who who were not living in Jerusalem at the time. They were visiting, they were there, and they were, they were amazed to see how this Christian teaching could, could be promoted, how, the, how, how these men were allowed to, to preach and teach, and, and they, were, they just hated it. And their focus became... Uh, intent upon stopping anything that that looks like Christianity that 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 talks about Christ that affirms Christ that glorifies Jesus. They wanted to stop it, and their focus became uh, intent on looking at a man named Stephen. He was their target. They were not going to stop with Stephen, but he was the one that they went after because Stephen, not only was he ministering to the church, but he also had uh, the ability to be able to teach. And he was talking about Christ and talking about Jesus and talking about the Lord and, and, and explaining the truth to people. So he became the target 
of their hatred, of their opposition. And so they, they did what they could to try to stop him from speaking and stop him from, from doing what he was doing. They, have, they attacked him at four different levels, at four different points, and they said, Stephen does not truly understand who God is. Stephen does not understand truly who Moses is. Stephen does not understand about the law, the Old Testament law. And definitely, Stephen does not understand about the temple and how we, we view the temple. And what was interesting is they were trying to stop Stephen, but the high priest who heard the, the accusations, they put Stephen in front of them and said, what do you have to say for yourself? <laughs> And so Stephen, he gets, to, he gets one more opportunity to, to, to preach. If you really are against Christianity, I'll tell you how to stop it. Or try to stop it at least. Don't let anybody speak about Christ. Don't give them any opportunities. But they gave Stephen another opportunity. And what Stephen does is he goes through this lengthy, he just talks. And as far as we know, no one interrupts him. And in his sermon, we began to look at it last time, in his sermon what he does is he addresses those four particular issues. He says, oh, you don't, be, you don't think that I understand who God is and that I'm opposing the true God of heaven. You don't think that I understand who Moses is. And that I'm opposing Moses. And the same with the law and the temple. It's interesting. When Stephen addresses these issues, he addresses them in historical order. He, he's walking them through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way through to the days of the kings, to the days of David and Solomon. He brings them all the way from that history. And you have to understand, David did not have a Bible app. Or uh, Stephen did not have a Bible app. All the, 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 the writings were on scrolls, and you didn't have one in your home unless you were very, very wealthy. They were all in, the, the scrolls were resided in the synagogue. And so what he does is he recounts that history. He does it for two reasons. One, to show that he does know who God is, Moses, the law, and the temple. But secondly, not only does he know those, he says, I'm not opposing them. And actually, you are opposing them. He turns it back on them. You see, what was strange to the Jews is that how could people like Peter who they look at as a, you're just a fisherman. You have no education. Stephen, no education. These are common people. They didn't go through the school system. They, they didn't get trained in, in divinity. They, they didn't get trained in all of the studies. They were not well versed like the scribes and the religious leaders. And then how could they do what they do? How could they be so effective? How could they talk and preach in such a way that people listen to them? They, they, they could not believe it. And so it all came to the surface and it came to a point where there was going to be a clash. And Stephen is given the opportunity to, to preach. He's given the opportunity to say, to uh, address his accusers. And he does that. We looked last time, at, uh, as we walked through this sermon, 
uh, in verses 2 through 16, he, he talks about how God brought the people of Israel, how he, how he brought them in, um, into Egypt and out of Egypt. And what Stephen was trying to show there is that I understand who God is. I understand about our Lord. I understand about God. God is the one who we worship. And He is the one who led our people. He is the one who established a covenant with Abraham. And He is the one that will fulfill it. He rose up Moses. To be, as it were, like a, a savior and a redeemer for our people. To lead our people out of Egypt. I know who Moses is. And if you go back and actually read the history, as it's like he's implying this as he's preaching. If you go back, Jews, and read, read our own history, you will, you will see that not even the Jews of that day were willing to listen to him. And if you read the history, you will see how they griped and complained about even leaving Egypt. You would think that they would be praising God. No more slavery. And, and, and then so the people later on say to Moses, well, it would have been better if we would have been in Egypt. What? He said, go back and read the history. I know who God is. I know who Moses is. And I know them better than you. And I also understand the law. I understand the law. Verse 38. Let me pick it up there. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai and with our fathers. Now I have, I've given you a little sheet, right? And I don't have verses in there. But find the paragraph that talks about law. And that should help you follow along. So this is the one, he's still talking about Moses, who was in the congregation in the wilderness and the, with the angel who spoke to him at Mount Sinai with our fathers. Moses received living oracles. That, that speaks of the law. To give to us. Yes, I know about the law. God gave Moses the law to give to all of us. So that we would know how to live towards our God. But our fathers refused to obey him. It's, it's as though Stephen's implying here. You Jews talk about upholding the law. Oh, we uphold the law. You know, our ancestors couldn't. They did not obey it. They thrust him aside. And in their hearts they turned to Egypt. And they said to Aaron... Make for us gods who will go before us, breaking the first commandment. As for this Moses who led us out of the land of Egypt, you see, they had no respect for Moses. We do not know what has become of him. But they made a calf in those days. They offered a sacrifice to the idol. They were rejoicing in the works of their hands. But God turned away and gave them over to worship the host of heaven. As it's written in the prophets. Did you bring to me slain beasts and sacrifices during the 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You took up the tent of Moloch and the, gar, the star of your God, Rephan, the images that you make to him, and I will send you into exile beyond Babylon. Oh, I understand, I understand our history in regards to the law. You, th you actually think that I'm opposing it and I don't understand it? I understand it very well, Jews. The law was given by God for us, for our people. But if you look at the history of our people, they have rejected the law generation after generation. Look in, our, look in our history books. Look at, look at the Old Testament scriptures and you will see that there were many times <coughs> where they did what was right in their own eyes. And there were times where the law of God wasn't even visible. It was hidden. 
And later on, one of the kings found it. And in Nehemiah's day and Ezra's day, the law of God was read and it was as though we had never heard anything like this. Yeah, I understand about the law. I know exactly. I know full well. God gave us His law. And you are just like previous generations. You have no respect for it. You may proclaim that you honor it. You may say with your mouth that you honor it. But just like Jesus would say, you honor me with your lips, as he's quoting the Old Testament. You honor God with your lips, but your heart is far from it. You attack me and say I'm against the law. In fact, I understand it better than you. And then he addresses the issue of the temple. The temple. Verse 44. Our fathers had this, what's called the tent of witness. If you go back and read the book of Exodus, many chapters in the book of Exodus were, were describing how they would fashion and create what was called the tabernacle. The tabernacle was the place of meeting. The tabernacle was the place where, where God's presence would dwell with them. The glory of God. And that way they knew. It's not that God was bound by that, that he had to reside there, but he chose to as a visible expression that, that God is with them. Just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. And that's the second half of the book of Exodus gives you those um, particular instructions on the patterns. You know, it's got to be purple, it's got to be this, it's got to be that. It, they laid it all out. Our fathers in turn brought it, with, brought it in with Joshua when they deposed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. So now Stephen... Fast forwards up to the book of Joshua and he talks about how the nation, our nation, our people were going to go in to take the promised land. So they brought the tabernacle with them. So that tabernacle was there with our people until the days of David. Who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built that temple. The, the temple was built in, in the same likeness of the tabernacle. It had the same idea, but it was more fixed structure. But Stephen's point is verse 48. The Most High, though, yet does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? What is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things and what Stephen's trying to say is you, you say that I am attacking the temple that I don't even understand about the temple I know about the temple it started with the tabernacle God laid the parameters to Moses the tabernacle was built it was brought into the promised land and, and David wanted to build the temple and, and, and he was not allowed to but Solomon built that temple but here's the point Jews, you worship the temple more than you do God. You adhere to that building. You put more of your energy and your worship. You literally worship the building more than you do the God who created it and who fashioned it. The Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands. He's not limited by that. Heaven is his throne. The earth is his footstool. Yes, God wanted a temple built for the nation of Israel. But God's not limited by that. He's basically been telling them, you, would think, you think that I don't understand about God, Moses, the law of the temple. You think that I oppose God, Moses, law, and the temple. But in reality, I know these things very well. And in reality, you don't understand them. In your, in your worldview, in the worldview in which you live, in the belief in the, in the way you live right now, you, you actually oppose God, Moses, the law, and the temple. 
If Moses was standing right here giving you God's law, you would, you would disobey him and thrust him aside. If you were looking at the, the true law of God as written in the Old Testament, you're not going to believe it. You're not going to follow it. You're going to change it. You're not going to follow it the way it was written. Here's an example. The law says, you can go back and see it, find it. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And when you look at that, that's, Jesus said that that summarizes all of the law. But the phrase neighbor, neighbor. If you look at that word, the Hebrew word for the, that's translated by the word for neighbor. Person, fellow human being. If you go back and look at it in the Old Testament, you know what it means? It means to a Jew as it's been spoken to a Jew. The word means anybody and everybody, no matter their ethnicity. Okay? Neighbor could mean fellow Jew or Gentile. No matter their ethnicity, no matter their language, no matter their, the way they look, where they're from. Neighbor is not exclusive. It includes every single one. So when Jesus said, he's quoting the law, quoting the Old Testament, and the law said, love the Lord your God with, your, with all your heart, soul, mind, body, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. The neighbor means love everyone. Love those who treat you well. Love those who don't treat you well. Love everyone. You know that the religious Jews of that day had changed it? They would say, we honor God, we honor His law, but they would change it. And they would teach to people, they would teach to the crowd, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. They added the phrase, hate your enemy. So now neighbor doesn't mean anyone and everyone, it is everyone who is not your enemy. They created a theology that allows you to curse people, to, to be angry with people, to hate people. All you have to do is deem them your enemy. And you're, you're off the hook. If you have someone who is your enemy, well, you hate your enemy. And hate refers to opposition. It's the opposite of love. Did the law ever really teach that? No. But they had added that phrase. That's how they would teach it. And you would say, well, wouldn't, wouldn't the people be looking at their Bibles? No, because they don't have it. This, was how, this is just an example of how corrupt the system was. And when Jesus addresses that exact issue in the Sermon on the Mount, He says, you have heard that it has been said... You should love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. What is Jesus doing? He's correcting the error. He's correcting what they changed. Here's another one. Does the Old Testament, did the law that Moses gave, that God gave to Moses to give to the people, does it say, honor your father and your mother? It says that, right? What does honoring your father and your mother mean? Well, one of, the, one, of the, one of the applications to the word honor is that you will help them financially if need be. If they, yes, yeah, right, make sure she doesn't forget that. <laughs> I'm telling my kids that too. Adam's got to be a baseball star or something, you know, make a lot of money and daddy set. Told him that Adam will become, if Adam does that, I'm joking, you know, but if Adam does that, makes a lot of money, gets the big contract, I just need 10%. That's all I need, and I'm good. You're taking care of Daddy, honoring Father. 
Yeah, honor mother, but honor father too. <laughs> father comes first. So, but here Jesus would talk about this. He says, honoring father and mother means take care of them, right? You know how the you know what the Pharisees did? You know what the religious leaders did? They came up with a loophole. They said, oh, but if you want to give, let's say you have, okay, you have, uh, have um, 10,000 pesos. You're wealthy. I mean, you got a lot. 10,000 pesos. Sh- and, and you don't need it. You're either going to do one or two things with it. You're going to give it to your family to help them, or you're or you going to do something else with it. The Pharisees, the religious leaders would say, oh, you can give it to God. Ah, oh, you mean I can give it to you? Yes, when, when you give it to, the, to our, drop it in the plate, 10,000 pesos. Well, I need this to give to my family. Oh, tell your family that it's Corban. They came up with this word called Corban. Corban means it has been devoted to God. And say to your father and mother, Father, mother, I would have helped you, but I was compelled and needed to give this monetary gift to God as an act of service and worship to God. Sorry, but And Jesus confronts them on that and says, you have violated the clear teaching of the Word of God by creating this loophole and it's called a teaching of man. You have changed the Word of God and corrupted it by adding this Corbin law, which was never really in the Old Testament. This was how corrupt the system was. And Stephen is opposing that and saying, you would not obey the true law the way it's worded. You violate it. And the, in the temple, you worship the temple more than you do God. You really don't understand who God is. You don't even understand who Moses is. You don't understand the law. You don't understand the temple. Hey, for that matter, you don't even understand what's been going on for years. You don't understand that we live in a world of sin. Let's go back to Adam and Eve. You don't get it. You're living your right, your religious life thinking that by doing all these duties, you're going to get to God. But in reality, the problem is you're sinners, your your heart is wicked, and you're on the road to hell. And if you don't wake up, you're going to die in your sins, just like Jesus told you. Every sermon has an application. Verse 51. Here's Stephen applying the sermon. You stiff-necked people. That's not how you win friends and influence people. (laughs) Uncircumcised in heart. And ears, you know. I mean, you you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Now that's direct. He's basically telling them, why did Jesus come into this world? To save stiff-necked people like you and I. People on the road to hell. People on uh, living in sin and trapped by sin. We need a Savior. If you go back and read the Old Testament, you will, you will learn that we all need a Savior. And that the future Messiah would be that Savior. But you're stiff-necked. You're uncircumcised in heart and ears. That is, to say it that way is like, I mean, the Jews prided themselves on circumcision. You know, they were the ones that would say, we are the circumcised. It was their, their identity for the covenant. To say that they're uncircumcised is like hitting them in the face. And Stephen's letting them, he, he's saying it for the effect. You're uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. <laughs> now, just imagine if you're those Jews. 
You don't believe a word he says. You think he's dumb, crazy, believing in this Jesus. And you've had to listen to this sermon and now he's applying it like this. Which of the fathers did you not, did your fathers, or which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? The prophets were sent by God. Go read them. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and all the other prophets were sent by God. They received the word from God and spoke. And they didn't really like Jeremiah when he preached. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who announced beforehand, before he ever arrived. The prophets would prophesy of the coming of the righteous one. That's a, that's a way to say, you guys are unrighteous, so am I. The righteous one, the holy one, the prophets, go back and read them. They would prophesy of that. And the fathers, the, our ancestors, would kill them for it. Whom you now have betrayed and murdered. <laughs> See, he, he, take, he, he gets them to Jesus. And he's basically saying, listen, I, I get it. You have hatred in your heart for Jesus. I get it. I understand. It's not right, but I understand. You've betrayed him, you've murdered him. And you're glad of it. Man, you, that, that was your happy day. People talk about, find your happy place. Have you been seeing this? I've seen people on Facebook. Oh, you need to go find your happy place. Boy, the Jews were in their happy place. The day that Jesus died, they were happy. That's what they've been wanting. That's what they've been desiring. You betrayed him and you murdered him. And you who received the law as delivered by angels did not keep it. You want to say that you're righteous? You want to say that you're religious? You want to say that you follow God and you really follow Moses and you follow the law and you, uh, that you really under, uh, revere the temple and what God did for the temple, how he built the temple. Honestly, people, he says, your hearts are wicked. Your ears are stopped up. You're not going to hear the truth. If you go back and read the Old Testament, it all led to Jesus. Jesus came He's died, he's risen again, and you're not willing to listen to the truth that will save your soul. You are the same as those who received the law initially back in the Old Testament, and they did not keep it. So judgment awaits for you. Unless you truly bow your knee to the Savior Judgment awaits. Now Stephen's preaching this sermon. He's trying to answer his those who accuse him. He's really preaching this sermon in the lion's den, so to speak. He's right there with the religious leaders. And he preaches this sermon, accuses them of sinful living, accuses them that they're on the road to hell. I mean, this is not the political correct way to preach. This is not warm and fuzzy. This is not your best life now. This, this kind of preaching will get you killed. It's direct. It's straightforward. It's, it's pointed. And I don't know. Maybe Stephen realizes this is his final sermon. But they've always told us. Preach like it's your final sermon. You may not get another one. Preach your heart. Preach, preach what needs to be said. And that's what he does. What you see here 
is you see conviction by Stephen, you see commitment, you see faithfulness, you see that he truly does understand the Old Testament and he proclaims it, he summarizes it. But he does it in such a way to take the Jews that he's talking to and help them to see that if they really truly went back and read the Old Testament for themselves, read those scrolls, they should see that they are sinners in need of a Savior. And that the only Savior could only be Jesus Christ. Never quip alone. The guy is crazy. Believing he's the Son of God. Jesus is the only one. He is the righteous one. So imagine you were one of those Jews. And literally, you're, you're being opposed by Stephen. I mean, Stephen just, it, he brought out the cannon and blew you away. I mean, this is evangelistic. If you're a Jew living in your sin, you better repent. And that's what Stephen's saying. This sermon will make you feel uncomfortable. This sermon will... will Will, will make you think about your life. And Stephen is saying, hey, you need to go rethink your life. You're on the wrong path. But how did they respond? Now, I'm going to develop this more next week as we come bring this. We've got to go, we gotta go to chapter 8, verse 3. Uh, but uh, that's for next week. But I want to give you a little bit of a preview. Now take a look at this in verse 54. This is after, immediately after he um, finishes his sermon. Now when they heard these things, they had listened to it all. <laughs> they, heard, they heard everything he said. They're probably thinking, how can somebody this dumb... Uh, think he can teach me anything. This lowly person, Stephen. He is not educated like we are. They heard everything he said and they heard the application to the sermon. What were they feeling? Anger. It says they were enraged. They were not happy people. They didn't have happy, happy, joy, joy. They were enraged. This was remember Jesus said, out of the out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, out of the abundance of the heart, people do. And what's filled their heart is rage. This is not just someone who says, this is not Gamaliel. Gamaliel says, just be indifferent. This is, you know, I mean, these people are enraged. And what do they do because of their rage, because of their anger? <coughs> you may think this is, this is something out of a walking dead. It says they ground their teeth at him. I mean, did they literally go and start eating? I mean, you just, what is that? It doesn't mean they went and started, they didn't become zombies, okay? Say it that way. It's not that. It's an expression. When it says they grind their teeth at him, you know, Jesus would talk about hell. He would talk about what hell is. And um, he'd say where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Remember that? I don't know if you fully understand that. The expression of that, the weeping you understand, that's sorrow. You know what gnashing of teeth refers to? What is the opposite of sorrow? Bitterness and anger. I mean, they're, they're two bad things, but they're opposite emotions. They coexist at the same time. So when you're in hell, hopefully none of you go there. But if you want to go to hell, it's not a good place. 
There's weeping, there's sorrow, eternal sorrow and eternal anger at the same time. Talk about an emotional roller coaster. They were so enraged, it said they ground their teeth at him. That means that they were literally going to attack him physically. I mean, they're like, you know, I mean, it's just the hatred becomes visible. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, they're always angry, right? I mean, it, it's, 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 it's horrible. And we're going to develop, I'm going to look more at this next time, but if you go down to verse 58, which is down in that paragraph, it says they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. Because of their anger, because of their being enraged, they literally went and grabbed him by force, visibly displayed their anger and their opposition, and they were out for blood. And they stoned the guy. They just throw stones until he's dead. It just keeps coming. No stopping. Stephen was going to die that day. No matter what. They were going to see to it. They had decided that he was worthy of death. For what he had said. This is when two worldviews clash. The worldview of biblical Christianity does not, it's not in, it's not in line with the, biblical, or the, the, the view of this world, the worldview of, of everyone else. They clash with each other. There is righteousness, unrighteousness, holiness, unholiness, godliness, ungodliness they they're like two separate things they don't they don't they 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 don't live together and this is why what you see here is 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 another way of Jesus expressing i came to bring a sword i came to bring a division stephen's sermon has one goal in mind and that is to clearly Present the truth of God and to these Jews who are living in opposition to God and hatred of God and hatred of Christ and hatred of Christians. And, and the reality is, and this is what we're going to see next time as we look at these verses in more detail, what you're going to see <clears throat> is that this hatred for Christ, it jumps a level. It, it increases. It says in chapter 8, verse 1, they came and laid uh, their garments, this is in verse 58, at a young man named Saul. And in chapter 8, verse 1 says, Saul approved of this person, of Stephen's execution. That's what it was, was an execution. And what you see is that this level of enragement, animosity, hatred for Christ, for Christians, for the truth, for what they're preaching, it had now grown to the level where Maliel's gone. They're not buying his stuff anymore. They're out to get him. And this is just the start of the persecution that will begin. This is really the start of it all. It's been boiling and boiling and boiling, and now it's the the we have an expression: the cat is out of the bag. I don't know what that means, but it's. It, I mean, I, I can't visualize it, but it means that it's you can't put it back. You know, Pandora's box has been open. There's no going back. And persecution will begin, and it starts with this guy Saul. Now, we know what will happen to him, but persecution of Christians has been going on ever since. 
And what you find is interesting is that Paul, the first time you meet Saul, who will become Paul, he is, ex he is in charge of an execution of a Christian, right? You want to know how Paul dies? Paul dies in a Roman cell. He's in a Roman cell. And then his head is chopped off. As an act of persecution by the nation of Rome against those who would claim to be Christian. It's interesting that Saul is willing to execute a Christian. But after becoming one, he has to face that same thing for himself at the end of his life. Kind of interesting. The point of this sermon, though, is that Stephen was faithful and honored God in what had to be said at that time and in that situation. The truth had to be proclaimed, and he proclaimed it. And he didn't fall back, and he didn't change his approach. And he stood his ground, and he was faithful to do that which needed to be done and needed to be said. And that's an example to all of us. I'm saying, what I'm not saying, don't go out there and get killed tomorrow because of preaching for Christ. Don't go, don't go trying to be a martyr. The point is, be faithful in what God's called you to do. Speak the truth. Speak it in love. I, Stephen spoke this not out of hatred, but in love. It was the Jews who had the hatred, not Stephen. Speak the truth in love, but speak the truth. God will give you opportunities. Maximize those opportunities to tell people about the true saving knowledge of Christ. A lot of Filipinos are very religious, right? They'll tell you they're Catholic, they're religious. They bought into a system doesn't mean their hearts have been changed. And you meet people all the time. They may know a little bit about God, about Jesus, whatever their church has told them, but they really don't understand the truth. They don't understand the condition, the condition of sinful heart and how they need a Savior, a true Savior, who can save them from their sin. But Stephen preaches the word of God, preaches the truth, and never lets, never stands down. And it's an example to us of faithfulness. Let's pray. Lord, we're so thankful for what you teach us, what you show us from your word. Lord, how Stephen, a man devoted to God, devoted to you, and how what he preached becomes an example for us of that the truth needs to be proclaimed even if we're directly facing the enemy. Lord, we may not face the extreme like Stephen did, but when we are telling others about you, about, about what you did, how you came into this world, the love that you have for, for us and how you saved us and how we you, you, you led us to repent of our sins and turn to you in faith Lord that worldview clashes with everyone else in this world it's not the way people think and Lord there's there's opposition to the truth there's opposition to those, by those who would not want to hear the truth. But Lord, let us be faithful witnesses of the truth and faithful teachers of it. Lord, we give you thanks in Jesus' name.